All right. Uh, let's start again. Should warn you that everything you say now it will be on YouTube in a, in a few hours. Um, okay. Uh, very good uh, propositions this far. Uh, I think you, you have some good ideas, uh, most of you, about what to write about. Um, of course, you're, you're still free to change your topic, uh, even after you've submitted it, but uh, I wouldn't advise uh, that you do that, because uh, it's fairly limited uh, time that you have. So uh, use the, the next uh, week or two to, to make up your mind. Now, what we remains to be done is, is a few more points about uh, the writing process, things that are included in this small booklet, and, uh, and uh, then uh, trying to uh, work a little bit further on, on your propositions. Now, let's just uh, have a look at, uh, at a few titles. We have already mentioned that uh, uh, there are some um, guidelines on what might be a good subject and a good title. What about this one? International Shipping and the Environment? Is it good? Could be everything, or almost everything at least. Quite a broad topic. Describes a subject area, not a problem, or an analytical approach. So a slightly better solution. Oh, this color doesn't show very well. A survey of ship owners' attitude to double hulling of crude tankers. Uh, double hulling is about uh, having double skins on tankers in order to prevent pollution. That has been a, one important element of shipping and the environment. So this is more specific. It gives a clear indication of the subject area and, and what kind of research method is used. It's a survey of ship owners attitude means that uh, there is some sort of interviewing uh, as the methodology here. Now another one cost benefit analysis of public road projects. Is this good for an essay in this class? Obviously it's not the best one since I propose it and try to criticize it, but what, what's wrong with it in a setting like this? What does it sound like? Where would you like, would you find such a title? What kind of document would it be? Sounds more like a, a textbook, right? A thorough manual, maybe? A big document, not a small essay. A, an essay is a short, and, and, and very narrow kind of, of paper. Sounds more like a comprehensive textbook and does not identify the problem areas that will be addressed. I'm sorry about the colors. They look entirely different on my computer. Does prioritizing public road projects according to the cost-benefit ratio tell the whole story? An analysis of the potential shortcomings of CBA used as a decision tool. This is more specific and says something about the research methodology. This is a fairly typical way of um, giving titles to academic uh, publications. Uh, it's a two-stage approach. The first sentence uh, uh, poses the research problem or, or the area, and then the second one gives more detail about the methodology applied. Finally, Transport in Norwegian furniture industries. This uh, has identified the focus of the analysis, but not what kind of research methodology or research questions there are. How does the Norwegian furniture industry, uh, or how do the Norwegian furniture industries evaluate road versus sea transport? Interviews with managers in the furniture export industry. Um, a much better approach, once again, more specific and analytical. Right, so let's switch to sources. As I said, this would be approximately half of uh, the work, is to find the right sources, read them, and, uh, and um, choose the ones that you would use. 
The first step is to identify some key research terms that fits well with your subject area. And it, could, it should quite often be combinations of terms, like maritime transport and emissions, freight transport and mode choice. When you do that, you could, of course, use the general uh, search engines like Google. Um, it will generally give you too much in irrelevant information, but it could be useful if you have good search strings like this. If you use the quotation marks like this, you force them to be together as well. So instead of just entering maritime uh, and then transport, if you have the quotation marks around it, it's only maritime transport and not maritime or transport. So this means that you get the exact phrase. So that's a, a good idea of limiting the search a little bit. Okay. Now, you should be very aware of that posting information on the internet is open to anyone and that you must be very critical uh, and make sure that this comes from a serious source that you can use as a reference and, and back up your work and your statements. So, as I said, one of the assessment criteria is whether you have shown that you're able to have a critical approach, that you're able to evaluate the, uh, how um, good the sources are, and then you should ask questions like this. Who provides this information? Could they be stakeholders? Meaning that they have a special vested interest in the area. Let's say we took the, your proposition about uh, writing about the deepening of the River Elba. Um, and you find a web page which contains information here. Um, who could be stakeholders in such a, an example? Who could have a special interest? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if, if, if this web page, which just said environmental issues rela related to the deepening of the River Elba, and you find out that this is provided by a transport company, let's say Maersk Shipping or something like that, would you expect this to be biased somehow? To be, would you trust that source? Really? Not really, no. Because they're a stakeholder, they have certain interests, uh, on the other side of the same thing, if you find out that this is uh, a web page made from uh, people who live along this river, residential areas or something like that, they are also stakeholders. They have a special interest. And I'm not saying you couldn't use that kind of information, but you should use it critically and identify who the source is. Using official websites of trusted sources is, uh, is uh, usually a safe way. Uh, I have two examples here. The IMO is the International Maritime Organization. So if it's about shipping, this is the UN, the part of the UN that deals with international shipping. That's a fairly official uh, channel and should be uh, of good quality. Uh, Britannica is uh, probably the most well-renowned general reference source, uh, Encyclopedica. You're probably more used to using this one. And I don't know, the foreign students may... I don't know if you have rules in your home universities about using e Wikipedia. Do you? It's not, it's not allowed. Yeah. No, we, we don't have a general uh, saying that it's not allowed to use it, but I would say be extremely careful check uh, with other sources and at least look at the references. Usually after a Wikipedia article you have the sources identified on the bottom and you can then click on those and see if those, uh, these sources are um, reliable or not. I know that there are some quality assurance procedures in Wikipedia but they are, they are generally not sufficient. Okay, using blogs and forums and things like that is rarely okay. This is not the kind of source that you want, should use in a paper like this. One good starting point if you're looking for uh, textbooks or research reports, uh, you can use a database called BIBSIS. This contains all the academic libraries in Norway. Uh, and if you find something here, it would either be 
present in our library or in a different college or university and you can have it ordered for you at no cost. You just ask the librarians and they, you will have it in, within a few days if it's available in a different library. Um, we also have a number of librarians uh, which are well qualified and, and Ms. Hustmark here is the one that is a specialist on transport and logistics sources. So if you ask for her, she would be able to guide you to the specific databases pertaining to, to logistics and transport. But the others would be able to give you help as well. And they are there to, to help you, so please make use of them. Other sources, um, I would say that once you find one article or one research paper or um, another piece of information uh, which is well related to your subject, then you, you've done quite a lot of the work because then you can start nesting. You use the list of references in this report or this article and check out are there further references. Some of these databases like the ISI Web of Science that we subscribe to, you can also track if you find, let's say you find an academic article from 2008 that is well related to your subject, you can actually automatically track whether other articles are citing this one afterwards. So the, the, this is very good now, uh, especially with academic articles. You can track them. Has other authors uh, cited this? Well, then you can easily find it once you have the first one. So it's pretty much about finding the first reference. Then you can start nesting. One thing is to find other works that cite it, but you can also identify is there a specific author or a specific research institute that has done something with this? Then you can go directly to their homepage and find more information there. Um, there is a list of the databases that we subscribe to on the, on the web page of the library, but the librarians will always be uh, there to, to answer your questions. But here are a few of these, um, these databases that you can use. Um, some of the references that you find there are available in full text, so you can just download the PDF file directly, but that is provided that you are on the, on the university network because it's checked whether it belongs to the right IP address. So you need to be on the, on the university network in order to download uh, the full text. If you find a reference, an article, which is not there in full text, maybe just the abstract, and we don't subscribe to it, you can go to the librarian with this reference and say, I would like a copy of this one. And then the librarian uh, would ask another um, library to, to send this uh, as a scanned copy or something like that, and you can have it in, uh, in a few days. So the services of the library, you should absolutely make use of them. They are very good. Increasingly, the specific bit of Google called Google Scholar is getting a valuable source as well. Some of these, uh, the, the hits that you find here will also be available in full text because we subscribe if you're on the computer network of the college. Okay, reading. One, one thing is finding the literature, then of course you need to do quite a bit of reading, but you need to do speed reading because you need to scan through maybe 10 times as much as you're going to use in the end. And the ways to, to scan through it is, of course, judging by the title, the keywords first, but then to read abstracts and tables of contents. And be quite critical. Uh, if it's not well related to your subject, just uh, leave it. And then you make a short list for more proper reading. And my advice is that you keep writing all through the research process. Uh, Make notes and write your reflections. Is this interesting? Why is it? Is it well related to the subject? Don't just read for a full month and then start writing because if you're anything like me, you will have forgotten what you read two or three weeks ago. So once you've read an article or a book or things like that, write a little bit about it and make sure you, you, um, you put down the, the reference information. 
So don't consider the reading process entirely separate from the writing. Um, I don't know if you want to use it now for this small paper. Uh, um, if you're going on to a master studies later on, you might uh, write a bigger thesis and then you can use it. But there is, we have an add-in program which you can have, which we have paid for for, for our students. Uh, so you can download it as an add-in to Word, which is basically a database that keeps um, your, all your references and an automated way of generating the list of references and so on. Uh, the library can help you uh, with uh, downloading it. There is a, now a simple reference tool uh, in Word, which might be okay for, for this short paper. Okay, the structure of the paper then. Uh, there is an opportunity in Word to use styles. Have you used that? Any of you? Styles? This means that you, you, if you choose, instead of formatting the heading with a specific font uh, and adding a number, you can say that this is a level one heading, called heading one, and the next one is heading two. And then you can automatically generate the table of contents afterwards. Uh, you can add new uh, headings in between and it will be automatically renumbered. So if you check this option in Word, it's, it saves you a lot of time in the end because then you don't have to renumber things if you delete uh, a heading and, and so on. So I would suggest that you start by creating these headings um, just uh, as a first start fairly early in the process and then write a few words on each section. What is it that I plan to do here and write about here? And then you start, of course, writing the contents of each section and changing the structure as you go is obviously okay. Um, towards the end, you should leave some time to write the summary. This is not just because you have to have a summary, but it's also a very good way of checking whether your paper is well focused. Is it difficult to write a summary because it's about this and that and not well focused? then maybe you need to do something about, about uh, the paper itself. So my suggestion is that you try to write a summary maybe a week you, before you submit it, and then you, you can use that also as a diagnosis of, of whether your paper is well focused or not. Typical overall structure of a paper like this, introduction, core and conclusion, in the introduction, you motivate the choice of topic. Why is this interesting? Provide some background information. Um, you, uh, you don't normally formulate formal hypotheses in a paper like this, a small one. But some research questions, what is it that you intend to analyze? This should be in the introduction. And then you tell the reader how you're going about it, what kind of information sources you've, you've used, and, and so on. And now I've skipped the core for a second and uh, jumped to the conclusion. Uh, should follow as a logical consequence of everything that you've written, of course, and tie things together. But in between, you have the core and a few pieces of advice there as well. Um, you should sort of guide the reader from one section to the other, uh, to make it sort of a logical structure. Um, you should follow what we might call a clear line of argument. You can do this by start with the brainstorming, uh, as we may have done already, um, and then draw some lines and circles and try to tie things together, maybe restructure and find uh, a good structure this way. You will have to describe something before you analyze it, but as we said initially, make sure the analysis is there, that it's not only descriptive. Um, the marker and the evaluation criteria will focus on whether it's clear and coherent and whether your statements are well supported by evidence. There are generally two ways of supporting your statements. Let's say you say that um, uh, shipping is the most environmentally friendly mode of transport. There are two ways you can 
support this statement, and you should support it. It shouldn't just stand there. You could either use other references uh, as a support and say that this has been confirmed by this and that author, or you can draw a line of argument yourself. You have to explain it. But don't make strong statements without having a foundation for them. Either your own line of argument or references to the literature or both. This sounds a bit silly, but it's generally a good idea, the rule of three. You should tell the reader what you're going to write about in the introduction. You write about it and then you sum it up and say, we have seen that, we have written this. This could, not, could also go for the subsections, not only for the whole paper, but for the main subsections. Let's say you have four or five chapters, you could follow this pattern and introduce each chapter. In this section, we will focus on this and that. Then you write about it and you end up, we have seen that, this and that. Now let's move on to the next subject area. Okay. I think we've made a few of these points uh, before to keep it uh, focused, keep sentences so short. This is, this is uh, as far as I know, none of you are native English speakers, uh, but you're free to write in Norwegian, Norwegian ones as well. But those of you who have to write in a foreign language, it's much easier if you keep the sentences short uh, and drop uh, redundant words and paragraphs. It enhances the readability. Now, using references, this is a very crucial point uh, and, uh, and something that you need to learn in academic writing. Most submitted papers have some shortcomings here and this will uh, um, perhaps prevent you from having a top grade if you don't master this. Some students might think it looks better if you present statements as your own ideas. Uh, it doesn't really in academia. You should show that uh, um, you have some support for your statements uh, and uh, it just gives you more strength to, to, uh, to use references well. And strictly speaking, presenting something as one owns, on one's own ID when it's not is cheating and uh, therefore could have consequences. You should uh, use act, uh, references quite a bit and this gives you a big plus in the margin when it's evaluated because it shows that you're able to relate your own work to what's already known. And uh, just a warning, I will not keep talking about this, you may have heard it in all the classes as well, uh, but um, we have a database called the Forus, I think it's situated in the Netherlands, um, which we subscribe to and which we use for, for uh, plagiarism some control. Now, so let's uh, say a few words about uh, using of, uh, of references. Um, you could use different forms of referencing. Uh, this is uh, uh, a more direct way of doing it, according to Yellow 2010. This is then found again uh, in the reference list, the full reference. Or you can use an indirect form and just come, uh, put up a statement and then indicate that this is supported by this paper. If you copy text and it's not uh, with references, then this is actually regarded as plagiarism. So the statement uh, should be uh, supported by the reference in order to, to do this well. The direct citations you should keep to a minimum uh, and the exemption could be if you interview someone and you want to have a longer uh, interview. Um, this is uh, the Harvard reference style. There are different styles of referencing. Uh, we don't have a particular one that we, is obligatory to use. Um, we have a, something called the Chicago style, which is recommended by our, our library. I've added the links to a description of that in, in the front of room. So if you look at the links section in the front of room for SEM 500, you will find the more thorough description 
But uh, as you can see, uh, there are different ways of, uh, of putting titles up, whether it's a book or an article in a book or an article in a journal and so on. If you use the EndNote add-in, uh, this is done automatically for you. Then you just choose an output reference style and if you choose the Harvard style, things will come out like this, as long as you have identified it as a book or a journal article and so on. Um, okay, I think we skip uh, one here. Now, just a few words about this database. We will then submit uh, your paper to this database after the deadline for handing in. Uh, it checks against reports, articles, papers, books, internet resources. Previous, all previous student papers are in the database. So uh, we will have a very good report sent back to us when this comes with matches and it's much smarter than a Google search. Um, and this sounds very serious, but it is. We have had some sad cases where students may be expelled and, and even lost their scholarships because of this. So this is something that we take very seriously. So make a forest your friend, guaranteeing fairness. This is about uh, all students being treated the same way. Um, so uh, this, is, I, this is blurred uh, on purpose uh, because I don't want to, to be very identifiable which one it is. But this is the kind of report that we get back. We get sort of a divided picture with they found the source and then they found the student text that matches this. And you can see uh, some of the words are, are color-coded, not matching, but most of the words are matching in this case. And this would be perfectly fine if the student had put up the name of the reference, where it's from. But if you don't, then it's uh, cheating. Okay. Quality control. Uh, towards the end, use the spell checking, of course. Uh, and uh, um, if you have the, when you work in groups, maybe it's a good thing to do some cross reading if you write different sections to have a fresh attitude. Uh, is the structure good? Is it clear, in, interesting, understandable? And uh, all these things, and does it follow a logical uh, line of argument? Um, one idea that might be good uh, towards the end is to add a number of extra headings. Let's say that you have level one and level two headings first, uh, uh, and then you add a third level of headings towards the end. And I call them newspaper style. Um, they could be, this means that if you look at uh, newspapers, you will see that. Uh, um, headings mainly highlight what's interesting in the following section. Uh, so it could be uh, instead of writing um, a heading called uh, um, uh, LNG vessels and emissions this is a slightly boring thing, a more newspaper style type of heading would highlight what's interesting in the following section. And if you've written a section about LNG vessels and emissions, you might instead say that um, uh, LNG propulsion um, reduces um, NOx emissions by 80%, for instance. It's probably more than that, but the difference is that this, this highlights what's interesting in the following uh, section. And you can al also use this kind of newspaper style headings to diagnostically and 
if it's hard to make this heading. It could be that the, the following section is not well structured or doesn't have anything interesting in it, and then maybe should be dropped. In this case, it could be that uh, the same section also talks about sulfur emissions. And then you couldn't make a heading like this for that section, and maybe you should restructure it and write one paragraph about NOx and one about sulfur. So doing it this way uh, towards the end could be a way of checking uh, whether uh, it has a good structure. Uh, and if you just read the headings towards the end, you can also more easily see if it does follow a logical line of argument. Okay, as I said in the beginning, uh, a tidy appearance, almost boring, one or two different fonts, use either bold or italics, not both of them, should be a formal scientific look, uh, proper margins of course, pag pagination, it's in quite often that, that papers come without page numbers. Uh, headings and figures and tables should be numbered, uh, at least the headings. Uh, if you only have a few figures and tables, you might drop that. Uh, make graphs readable. Um, some of you will probably use uh, graphs or illustrations taken from internet sources. Uh, and there are ways to do it. You should make sure it's, it's readable and of good quality. If you take it from a PDF file, just make sure you zoom it to the maximum size of your screen before you make a snapshot of it. Then, uh, then it, the resolution is much better. Okay. Table of contents uh, needs to be there. Uh, and a proper title page, uh, including your uh, student numbers. Page breaks, of course, towards the end. Now, a lot of good advice. The, this is supposed to be a rewarding experience, though. Uh, you uh, are able to dig deeper into an interesting area. Uh, you will hopefully work close with the advisor. Uh, at least we offer uh, you that possibility. Um, both Sven and I are pretty busy, so if you want to have a meeting, send us an email and we can make sure we, we uh, have some time for you. Or we could do the guidance via email. This is a very relevant way of working uh, and a sort of a problem-based learning. And of course, you should be very satisfied when the job is done. Towards the end, uh, a lot of good advice. I will not uh, repeat this. This is from a, a university professor of, of Leeds. Now, um, this is what I thought we will do towards the end. You have you just started in the, in the previous hour uh, to develop uh, um, some ideas, individually or in groups. And, uh, I'd just like you to finish now by, by spending uh, a little bit of time. It says 25 minutes here. Maybe we'll do with a bit shorter, let's say 15 minutes. Then we'd, my suggestion is that we drop the break and we use 15 minutes for this to further elaborate a little bit. You discuss in groups and then we do a plenary session towards the end and uh, see if we come up with any more interesting things. What we didn't address in uh, the previous review is, for instance, potential data sources or, or where we can find information. So if you try to develop that a little bit for the next 15 minutes, sit together, and then we'll finish a bit early, uh, but make a short uh, summary towards the end. All right, your turn again. <coughs>